Yeah. I'm just starting the recording now. Okay. Welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Nod. I am the chair of the Vermont Citizens Advisory Committee on the Future of Lake Champlain. It is uh, Monday, May 9th, our May meeting. Um, tonight on our agenda, we've got some continuing Roundup Gobi response from uh, Meg Modley and Eric Howe from the Basin Program. Um, we'll have a discussion related to planning for our June meeting and some preliminary uh, discussions around our July retreat planning. And then to close the meeting, we'll have Commissioner Chris Herrick and Eric Palmer from Fish and Wildlife, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, an opportunity for Chris, who's never um, had a chance to have a conversation with us. He's relatively newly appointed and um, hoping that we can have a good conversation about public access and then invasive species prevention and control, including round goby and uh, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife uh, uh, response to, to the concerns that we've been discussing for the last few meetings. So um, first, who else is on the meeting? Uh, I see you, James and Ricky. Do you want to introduce yourselves and then we can move to public comment? My name is Ricky Lauren and I'm on the New York CAC and I'm always interested in new ideas and up to date information. Thanks, Ricky. Good to see you. And uh, James. Uh, James Maroney from Leicester, Vermont. And James, I know you sent me. Um, a statement, but do you want to go ahead and read that? I'm happy to do that, Mark. You want me to read it right now? Uh, yeah, now is good. I, I don't think we've got any other public comment unless uh, okay. I see Vic just joined us. Vic, do you do you want to introduce yourself and uh, and then if you have any public comment, and then we'll go to James. Sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, Vic Putman. New York Citizens Advisory Committee Chair, and uh, interested in the uh, updates on Round Gobi. Okay. Thanks. Okay, James. Okay, um, <clears throat> the business model we now refer to as conventional farming was introduced in the 1950s. The model exchanged cheap but toxic chemicals for time-consuming and expensive crop rotation and mechanical weed control. As designed, the model's efficiencies raised crop yields and lowered costs to such a degree that by the 1970s, its adoption was near universal. Unfortunately, the, models, the model also entrained other results farmers were less enthusiastic about, first among them overproduction, which drives down farm prices and drives up farm attrition. Second, the model deposited many times more soluble nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil than crops could take up. These substances ran predictably down the hill into the nearest stream and eventually into the lake where near half the pollution is attributed to quote unquote agriculture. Organic agriculture was also introduced in the 1950s as an antidote to these problems. However, farming organically costs more and organic food also costs more. Farmers were understandably interested in greater yields at lower cost and not understandably concerned uh, that the knock-on effects would decimate their income and their numbers. Be that as it may, Vermont permits farmers to farm conventionally, even as the legislature enacts at great cost, dozens of programs designed only on their faces to reduce problems these programs have empirically failed for 60 years to reduce. This Faustian bargain serves neither farmers, taxpayers, or the environment, yet it lives on. Now we learn that conventional farming also pollutes the atmosphere, and Vermont is very concerned that this problem requires an immediate and strong response. Consequently, in 2021, the legislature, enact, uh, legislature enacted, and over the governor's veto, the Global Warming Solutions Act, which seeks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2025, 50% by 2030, and 80% by 2050. These goals are not guidance, they are mandates. In spite of the fact that the state provides both explicit and implicit support to dairy farmers to continue farming conventionally, conventional farming is heavily dependent upon synthetic fertilizer and herbicides, both derived from fossil fuel. 
conventional farming cannot reduce its use of fossil fuels and cannot therefore ever be climate friendly. Consequently, the state cannot both support conventional farming and meet the mandated goals of the Global Warming Solutions Act. These two goals stand in contradiction to one another. My question to you today is, will the CAC advise the legislature of conventional farming's inherently flawed design and of organic farming's capacity to remedy, to remedy it in this year's annual recommendations? Mark, you're on mute if you're speaking. Lost my cursor. Um, thank you, James. Um, I'll do a quick response. I know that during the uh, committee's discussion of our action plan this year, we spent a lot of time looking at the Global Warming Solutions Act to um, integrate and support um, where we saw opportunities. And, um, you know, we've had continued conversations and discussions about how conventional dairy in particular, but conventional ag in Vermont, um, and that commodity agriculture is suffering and we continue to subsidize it and at what additional costs. And so, I've noted it and I will will bring up your points and have that discussion at our July retreat meeting and we'll try to have some updates on that as we follow up with some of our uh, prior work on agroecology, carbon sequestration and other issues that we know uh, agriculture is hoping to be a part of, but uh, there are significant challenge. So. The, the main point that I want to make, Mark, is that conventional farming cannot be adjusted to be climate friendly. It cannot be adjusted to become climate friendly. Um, I, James, I might agree with you wholeheartedly, um, but your question is to the committee. Will the committee make that recommendation? And um, that's something that we'll have to have a discussion about to develop our consensus for uh, moving forward with uh, part of our action plan for next year. So thank you. Thank you for your consideration. We definitely, it will definitely be on our agenda for our um, July retreat planning okay. conversations. Um, any other public comment? Katie, did we get anybody else new? I. I thought I saw someone I didn't recognize. No, I guess that's everybody. I got people's initials. All right, so um, next is the draft. Uh, well, any changes to the or suggestions for our um, agenda for tonight? Right now, we're going to get 15 minutes from Meg and Eric on their round Gobi response. Uh, we have a half hour to talk about our June meeting and July retreat, and then um, the rest of the meeting with fish and wildlife. So not a lot of time to adjust, but if anybody, any of the committee members had anything to add um, after the round go be, that would be the time. Hearing none, then um, the draft April 11th meeting summary. Can someone give me a motion to Accept and we can. Thanks, Lori. Um, second. Yeah, from Karina, Wendy. raise her hand. OK, thanks. Um, any edits or comments on them? I think they were really great. Again, thanks again, Katie and Lauren and everyone for pulling them together. Um, uh, I think what's been easiest is uh, any abstentions? Otherwise, all those in favor? Aye. 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 
Okay. Just and a quick note, if I may, Mark, um, to you know Lauren and Katie and um, you for your oversight. These are challenging minutes, and I think you know they do a fabulous job. They're really walking that fine line between uh, really conveying um, accurately what is there, and it's. You know, it's hard to do this in any environment. It's hard to do it in a Zoom environment too. And I know you have recordings, but I know there's a lot of time investment in this. I kind of call minutes the hours and um, uh, hate doing them. So I really um, very grateful for the thoroughness and um, accuracy and the diligence on it. And shout out since it's certainly not an easy job. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Lori. Um, I know a few people have read them who didn't participate or or watch the recordings and felt like they got a really good sense of what went on and the the gist and depth of discussion. So um, it's they've been really great. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Um, OK, so Meg and Eric, we're ready for you if you are. I'm ready, Eric. Would you like to start or do you want me to go? Go ahead, Meg. OK. Well, thanks for having us back uh, to talk about Round Gobi. We do have an update and some new news on the first round of the environmental DNA sampling that we've contracted with USGS and US Fish and Wildlife Service to conduct. Many of you probably saw the press release that went out um, just on Friday. Um, that announced that USGS and US Fish and Wildlife Service had analyzed the samples that were collected at the confluence of the Mohawk and the Hudson, and then they sampled for eDNA um, just downstream and upstream of Loch C1 and downstream and upstream of Loch C2, and then they went up to um, up towards the height of the canal system as well and took samples there. So the report from USGS um, was that they hit a good window. We've had a lot of flooding and a lot of debris and turbidity um, and the timing at which they took the samples, which was on April 14th, happened in a little bit of a lull in those um, extreme um, events and runoff um, and they were able to collect enough water uh, and filter it to get um, sufficient information to analyze to determine if there was any um, live or dead material of round goby present in the water that was sampled. So it's April, it's early season, it's cold weather. Um, round goby should be waking up and I mean, they don't sleep during the winter, but they should be starting to move around more. Um, later in the field season when it gets warmer. So the results of that eDNA analysis and that water sample filtration was that there was a detection of environmental DNA at the confluence of the Mohawk and Hudson, but no detections were present at the other six sampling locations. Um, that is good news that um, they haven't been detected further north. Um, however, you know, the absence of evidence is not absence of individuals necessarily. This was one sampling event um, in April. The next sampling events are going to be um, increased in number and in sampling technique in June. Um, so those will include additional sites to do the eDNA sampling. They'll be trawling and electrofishing. And again, if any round goby are collected later in the field season, they will be analyzed to see if they're carrying any of the harmful pathogens like the viral hemorrhagic septicemia that we're most concerned about getting into Lake Champlain. So that um, I, I just want to put it out there that this was a really huge effort by USGS and US Fish and Wildlife Service. They turned the data around very quickly and they did the quality assurance on it. So it's um, referenced data. The data is in a USGS data release. There's a link in the press release. We can drop it in the chat that can take you to the site that shows um, you know, where the sample sites were and what the results were. Um, we're going to meet again as a rapid response task force this Thursday and talk about a number of topics, including um, when the scheduled sampling will be in the Richelieu River to our north with the Quebec Ministry of Environment, um, when we're going to target our June sampling, 
whether and if additional sampling should be conducted. Um, we're also going to hear from NIPA, New York Power Authority, and the Canal Corporation about a separate contract that they've entered into with some um, engineers to look at uh, what they call interim mitigation measures. So as you know, they've proposed to do double flushing of locks for traffic moving northward through locks C7 and C8 and doing limited lockaging, meaning scheduled lockings instead of just locking whenever anybody shows up. Um, in addition to that, they are starting to explore with their own resources some interim measures, which might include, and I don't have the details, but might include a suite of things like acoustic bubble or electric barriers um, specific for round Gobi until <coughs> we can get to the more permanent solution that would be proposed in the Champlain uh, Canal Barrier Study Project that we're working on with the Army Corps of Engineers. To that end, um, that phase one study is complete and the Army Corps has told us that they're just gathering final quotes for a press release. I believe we're expecting it this week, Eric, but um, you know, it this week or next. Um, so that yes, would be an something like that. <laughs> That will be additional data or information. It'll be a lengthy report that I'll talk a bit more about <coughs> the different barrier options that were proposed for all taxa um, on the Champlain Canal and a um, multivariate analysis and a cost benefit analysis. Um, in addition to that, um, the New York State DEC, the Canal Corporation and a subset of our rapid response task force are working on a round Gobi specific rapid response plan. I like to best defer to it as a threshold plan that would say if detected here using whatever type of technique, eDNA trawling, what have you, then a certain action might be taken. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold and still have the cough. <coughs> so, um, we're starting to meet to go over um, that plan and it's not, it's just been started to be drafted and we have a lot of back and forth, I think, to work on that rapid response specific plan for around Gobi. Um, but that's encouraging that we are going to work with DEC and canals on that, on that management plan. Um, and then finally, um, we were able to secure our top candidate for the AIS outreach specialist position that will be stationed full time um, with New York DEC out of the Warrensburg office. Again, this individual is funded by the Basin Program and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and their primary duties are to go out and um, communicate with the public the business owners, um, different stakeholders and, and local representatives along the Champlain Canal Corridor to talk about the threat of round goby, the threat of a bait bucket introduction and the need for an all taxa barrier um, to address invasive species in the Champlain Canal. Um, that individual um, is not able to come on board until um, the first or second week of June, but we are thrilled that you know, this person has to move and do other things that I think we have the right person for that position. Um, in addition to that, um, Director Howe's been working on a number of other sources for our phase two project for the Champlain Canal Barrier Study. Um, again, we've used Great Lakes Fishery Commission dollars um, from Senator Leahy um, to start the phase one study, it requires a 35% match and the phase two is estimated at over $4 million. So that would require about a $1.4 million match. Um, and so we're leaving no rock unturned and exploring the Champlain Hudson Power Express remediation dollars, as well as made an inquiry to New York State to see if they might be able to assist with some of the local match um, for the phase two study. Um, Dr. Howe, what did I miss? I don't think you missed anything, Meg. Nice okay. job. Thank you. So that's a lot. Um, a lot's happening still. We're meeting very regularly. Um, right now, uh, the canal is scheduled to open on May 20th, I believe, um, with those double flushing and limited lockages. Um, scheduling um, unless we detect something else in the interim. And I know those interim measures, we're gonna learn more from the Canal Corporation about what they're working with their contractors on in terms of acoustic or bubble or electric barriers um, that 
likely would not be able to be implemented this year, but maybe next year, which would still be ahead of an all taxa approach barrier. Yep. And I guess I'll just add that um, this topic, rightfully so, has been and continues to be uh, forefront in the in the media, the press. Um, I just did another interview this afternoon with VPR about it. Um, so that's you know that's good news. It's still a, still a, uh, an important topic for them that they think it's an important topic to to continue to cover and and uh, hopefully um, that won't die down anytime soon. I also know that um, Sean Good from Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department did a really nice article for the Lake Champlain International. Um, there you have a derby. I think it's a gazette that they call it. Um, and there was an article uh, that he wrote up about um, the threats around Gobi and Lake Champlain. So that got out to a lot of anglers. And maybe we can find the link to that and put it in the chat. But I'll drop the USGS um, data release right now into the chat. Thanks, Meg. It <clears throat> Um, any any questions from any of the committee? Go ahead, Lori. Um, thanks for that thorough update, Megan, Eric, and and for um, continuing to focus very intently on this. I'm wondering um, if you can also put in a link to the press release um, in the chat. But also, Meg, you noted that. Uh, it, it sounds like um, you, you're not necessarily surprised that they didn't find much um, north uh, 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 of the confluence given the time of year for for the original the the April 14th DNA that that um, it's more likely that we would find things later after they've woken up or more moving about is. Am I interpreting that correctly or can you clarify? Partially, or? yes. Thanks, Lori, for the clarification. I mean, we we tried to get sampling done as early as was actually physically possible to get out on the water because the results of the first round of sampling might have been impacting whether or not um, there would be an opening on May 20th. Um, so that data points, uh, we really, that first round of sampling, we really wanted to get in and get it analyzed and get some results on the table so that New York DC canals and basin program could talk together about what the implications of the results of that first round of data was. Um, it is a cold time. Um, they don't tend to move around as much in the winter. Um, so we would expect you know, that maybe later in the season we would have, um, you know, more information about whether or not they're they're really moving, but it's the, the winter time. And the good part about um, the Champlain Canal is that it's closed during the winter as well. So, you know, the locks, you know, the locks weren't open into the canal section up to Lake Champlain. Um, so, the you know, we'll talk about if we feel that it's necessary to survey again before the early, it would be the first week of June, really. Um, it's not that far away. Um, but that uh, based on other sampling across the Erie Canal Way and other sampling efforts, you know, USGS has basically advised that that's the best time to start sampling when you might start to see um, any results of movement. So, I think we're in the right windows. Um, we're going to keep talking about it. Um, and, you know, right now, this AIS um, round Gobi specific plan is not in place. So if we do get a detection, we're going to have to have conversations that would not have been agreed to ahead of time as to what steps might be taken. So, um, you know, I'm hoping round Gobi doesn't move quickly and doesn't get to the Champlain Canal and that we do have more time. Um, we won't make that assumption. Uh, we're going to keep after the sampling and keep communicating about what we're finding. Um, but I hope that clarifies a little bit about your question about whether or not I was surprised that we didn't find them beyond where we knew that they were at the confluence of the Mohawk and the Hudson. Thanks. Um, anyone else? I just say if you do get a chance to read the Derby guide, um, Sean Good really eloquently put together a number of different concerns and impacts and, you know, that, you know, what bass anglers might say about round goby and what the counter um, impacts might be if, you know, bigger bass, but maybe 
no early bass fishing season. There, there's some really good points put together that we had worked on for that article. Yeah, Sean, Sean did a really nice job of that. Um, I just dropped a link into the a PDF of that article into the chat here. I don't know if you all have access to it, um, Katie. I also, I think I dropped it into this meeting folder for this meeting. Um, so hopefully you can open it that way. I, I don't, I haven't found it online. This is just how it was circulated to us. Um, and then I also added a link to that press release that you were referencing earlier, Meg. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Meg, I had two quick just timeline clarifications. You mentioned the Richelieu sampling. D did you say that that may also include a second round of sampling when in the Champlain when they might be a little more mobile as the water warms up? So we didn't sample the Richelieu River in April, right. um, only the the Hudson Champlain Canal system. Um, the Quebec Ministry of Environment is going out to do routine sampling for other target fish species where they will collect um, uh, okay. water samples for eDNA analysis. And we're going to take advantage of that sampling because they have over 70 different sampling sites along the Richelieu River that they visit. So um, we're working with them to be able to either take some of their samples and analyze the ones that we think are you know, the most fitting um, for our right. concerns, or they may do the eDNA analysis themselves. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does the eDNA analysis, and they are collaborating with the other labs that do that analysis in Quebec. Um, so we're in a really good position in the fact that there's over 70 sites already identified in the Richelieu River. That data will be collected from that we can run for round goby. Um, I'm not saying we're going to run all 70 samples. I'm just saying we have quite a suite of opportunities to sample. Um, and that sampling, I believe, is not scheduled until later in June. OK. Maybe um, it won't be done for a June meeting, but I was thinking, um, they gave us a pretty comprehensive report at the steering committee um, and maybe we can find a way to share some of that information with the Vermont CAC just so we have some awareness on it, um, where it's located in that lower third reach um, and and their fairly aggressive uh, sampling protocol and tracking of it and then also that they have banned a live bait in Quebec. Yeah. So that was my other follow up. Did Sean make any mention? I haven't had a chance to read it. Did he make any mention about our concerns? Then, you know, as Tom Barry suggested, it could be one bucket and all of the work on a on a physical barrier is for naught if uh, if the angling community isn't on board with um, being careful with live bait. Yeah, it's very targeted at anglers of all different type of all different kinds. Um, so I think that 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 point was taken. The issue about the use of live bait was not raised in the article that I'm aware of. I've read it a few times. Um, the the basin program helped do the you know the map for the article. Um, so I think that he has effectively addressed sort of the different angler angles to the possible impacts and the need to prevent bait bucket introduction. Um, and that's going to be kind of a full-fledged education and outreach campaign that we're going to do. We're pouring everything we've got into the Champlain Canal, all tax a barrier, but with this AIS outreach specialist position, plus working with all the different partners, we're working on all these messages mostly for bait bucket introduction. Um, there is a very small chance that early life stages of round goby could be transported in bilge water watercraft. Um, we do, however, have a relatively robust watercraft inspection and decontamination program that's been running in the region for over 15 years. Right. Um, so I think what we could do to address that pathway is really being supported. Um, and so I, I think we, we do want to focus on that bait bucket pathway. Yeah, I, and uh, you know, I've shared my experience going through the canal, and I just know that there's never been any communication with people going through the canal unless you're an angler and might have got it separately um, related to bilge water. And I just know, yeah. you know, my daughter is coming up, and I remind her she's coming up the canal right now. She just left to try to get around Jersey, and um, I reminded her that 
she needs to entirely flush their bilge water and a, a, the canal court might do something more along those lines as part of their communications too yeah that's a good idea mark and back in the day in 2000 and i don't know 13 or something when we were working with the canal corporation on supporting boat launch stewards along the canal system they're looking at doing that again um, but we had utilized they have sort of a psa uh, announcements, radio frequency that you're familiar with that um, the previous director was able to share messaging on about invasive species. Um, I think it's been mostly radio silent on invasive species since the director's change, but um, that might be a pathway by which we could deliver um, an effective message to those who are actually in and using the system. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm a little nervous about, congratulations on the, your top, top candidate but they're not going to be here till June already and it takes a right. while to get up to speed. And so, um, you know, not to dump more work on you all, but there's lots more communication work that needs to be getting into play um, urgently this year. So thanks again. Agreed. Um, okay, so. I have uh, Karina has a hand up. Oh, okay. go ahead, Karina, sorry. No worries. Um, Meg, th thank you both, Meg and Eric, for all your hard work on this. I do have a question about, I'm just not familiar with the USGS environmental DNA data, and I'm just looking at that website and wondering <coughs> if um, you could just briefly, quickly walk us through it. Is there an actual report or is it just like an Excel file and some imagery and um, it looks like a shape file? Yeah, so Karina, it's very limited. Um, USGS, usually they don't do the quality assurance and control process until the end of the season of data collection. They did backflips to get this data QAQC'd and the way that they are able to share this information with the public is through what they call a data release, which is really going to be the raw QAQC data, not necessarily a report supporting um, the information here. Um, that would be coming out at the end of the year. I do have a shorter report that I think I can share with you from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the eDNA analysis. Um, let me just double check and make sure I have clearance to do that. Um, but basically, short of this, we would have had a rather um, closed door discussion about what the results were from the sampling to inform the the resource managers whether or not we should be taking action based on the data and then QAQC it later. Um, so this was, we felt the first round was really important enough and USGS and US Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to go through that QAQC process so that the data would be accessible to the public, um, that they could stand behind it and Fortunately, um, they only detected it at the confluence of the Mohawk and the Hudson. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. It's not a super public friendly um, data release, as you're aware. I mean, their sampling sites have different labels on them that, you know, this is a USGS data release, um, but it is the data. And there's a citation. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks again, Eric and Meg. Um, uh, the next bit of time we have for about 20 minutes is to talk about our June meeting and our July retreat planning. Um, so our, our June meeting right now is scheduled for the 13th, um, Monday, June 13th. Um, I think additional follow up on the round Gobi. Um, and as I suggested, maybe we can have um, a sh at least some information that um, the Basin Program Steering Committee received last month from the Quebec Ministry of Environment on their work on monitoring round Gobi as it comes up the St. Lawrence and up the the uh, Richelieu Canal system. So um, follow up on that. Uh, one item we we asked, uh, didn't really expect uh, uh, much of a response, but we asked whether Agency of Ag and or DEC were interested in um, sharing any of their initial 
thoughts or comments we on the um, MOU related and related to the de-delegation petition that was uh, presented by CLF and VNRC and Lake Champlain Committee and partners. Um, uh, our intent was to follow up with the governor's deputy chief of staff and ask exactly what she was implementing as the liaison to help um, sort of fix the problem since um, that's what was shared with us during our action plan presentation. Um, Brittany declined and said, let's wait until the EPA has a chance to convene the parties and at least have some initial discussions. Um, I'm not aware of any movement in that regard. Lori, could you update? Do you have any? Nothing. And so I doubt that that will happen between now and June. So I don't think that we would have a much meaningful follow up unless for, you know, something urgently happened in the next uh, weeks for some reason and a meeting was called. Um, other items of interest that are on people's minds for um, for follow up in June before we move on to thinking about July retreat and and for retreat, uh, I think location, whether people feel that uh, we're at a point that we could actually have meeting in person or at least hybrid for those that might not be comfortable meeting and an approximate uh, uh, date um, so that we could be can planning those logistics and then continue to add to topic agenda, speakers, presentations, et cetera. Um, let's start with June meeting. Um, is there any items that we've discussed that folks feel like um, we've let linger, would like some more follow up on from either our action plan or um, other topics we've had? I know that we've been waiting for Joe Ayat at the uh, USGS to finalize the Lake Champlain um, water quality study for glyphosate and other ag agrochemicals. Um, our last outreach, it was not available. It might be available. It wasn't available for this meeting. It might be available for June. I don't think Joe gave any commitment on that. So if that's what was available, it would be great to hear from him. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, um, I can't seem to turn on the camera, but you can hear me, I suspect. We can. OK, um, I think it would be good to, at that point to get a postmortem on the legislative session as an agenda item. Um, I'm trying to think. Certainly, the uh, uh, legislator members of the committee um, could probably take the lead and from the both both houses on that. But if there's any uh, folks, perhaps from the administration or or agency that um, they think would be helpful in that, um, we might be able to uh, get them on board to kind of fill in kind of what 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 happened at the end <laughs> which is always different from what you think is going to happen at the end before the end or what didn't happen that might be um, something for us to carry forward again great idea jeff um any other thoughts now I have a thought about the um, meeting for the retreat, and I would I would like to see if we can try to meet in person, and uh, and do it with masks, and then we could feel comfortable about that. I think. Yeah, that it, it would be my hope that we could do something protected, and possibly something that's quasi outdoors, covered, but um in a place that has good airflow so that, that that would be my goal if most everyone is in agreement in that and i think that's achievable 
um, depending on timing, um, evening or uh, or during the day. Um, there's a number of locations like that that I think we could we could meet that was um, good spots and accommodated any concerns anyone had. I know Vermont is on fire again right now. Seems to be everywhere. Um, Lori, did you have? Oh, muted. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I think that's great, and I'm happy to set a date. The only thing I would note is I think the action plan in particular, it really benefits from having all our legislators there. So since um, three of them aren't with us tonight, I think we kind of want to check in and see if we can get a commitment from all our legislative members to be there for the whole expanse of the meeting before we finalize the date, because they are so key, uh, and I know we'll be at a new biennium, but it, it just seems that um, regardless, whether it's historical perspective that they would be sharing or um, just being at the legislature during the 2022-23 uh, session, they're really key in terms of helping us uh, you know, identify issues and approach, et cetera. So that's what I would recommend. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, right, my thoughts on date was to try to glean from the members that are here now um, dates that don't work so that we can f try to fill in the gaps and, and hope we get other people with alignment. Um, I, I suggested July because I think historically when we've tried to consider any time in August, it's nearly impossible to grab people. So. I'd like to keep focusing on July. Um, my sense was earlier in July, the first two weeks um, before people have shifted gears too much and are beginning to think about vacations and kids and all those sorts of things. Um, so are there, are there dates for the members present today? Um, you know, between the 5th and the 15th that are absolute exclusions for any of you individually? I guess we could say 5th to the 22nd to give us a little more room. The 5th to the 22nd of July, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay, that sounds good. If if uh, I guess we don't have to do it right now, but if folks wouldn't mind uh, checking their calendars and just sending to Katie and uh, me dates that you could not attend, that if it was on any any date, any date between the fifth and the twenty second, I can't make it, and block and that way we'll block those out and then we'll try and fill in um, from there with others, and we'll follow up to today's meeting, put a a doodle or something like that, that sort of we can try to isolate as, as many people as we can on a favorable date in July. After I, I was just, so you feel the like the last week of June is just too tough to try to do? Um, or I shouldn't say because that's right before 4th of July, but like when I don't know when the 4th of July falls, but when does that fall? Monday. Mm -hmm. So the week before that weekend. I mean, I guess we could include that, ex exclude Let's the long week of the fourth of July. Say, yeah, just see what they say. The twenty seventh. That is a, 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 certainly a reasonable attempt. OK. And are there specific I, so in general date we will follow up with a specific request, but I'd like everybody to think about what dates they can't to start with. Sometimes that's easier. Um, uh, and next is. 
um, topics and areas of of concern that we want to follow through on. Um, I noted to James uh, farming and uh, you know the, for me, it's unclear how carbon sequestration and uh, climate change related impacts related to agriculture in Vermont um, can be met with the goals that are we're trying to achieve both for um, climate global warming solutions act and also for water quality i continue to to be unconvinced that there's the capacity to really meet the goals that were set no matter how lofty they are so i do think that that's an important one for us to consider i i'd like some more follow-up on um what are the alternative methods or alternative solutions to uh, sort of our traditional farming that we might um, try to amplify in Vermont. Um, you know, for instance, cover crops are an important and successful, except we're noting now it increases the use of herbicide. So what what are those additional alternatives? Things like that, that um, I'd like to put some focus in because we're still relying a lot on farming to meet our TMDL. And uh, I don't see anything on specific on how farming will meet um, climate change. And I've been reading a lot in the last few months about it, and it's a, it's a huge challenge. So um, I'd like to build a chunk of time and get some presumably UVM or New York um, experts to help us talk through some of those issues and maybe better define what might be um, uh, recommendations as we work towards action plan or maybe further investigation. Uh, Lori, you have your hand? Yeah, I think that's great. It's a great way to frame it. I think we should just you know, keep that specificity so we don't lose it as we go along. And I would add to that, I, I, you know, maybe it's swept into this, but, you know, one is jurisdiction. So the uh, corrective action de-delegation uh, uh, petition in terms of what, you know, what that's all about, uh, that I think we want to also follow up on the authority of, of regulatory enforcement. Uh, in light of the recent court case of Orsavelt decision, I think tile drains is also something to revisit, uh, and because uh, and and that that ties in with what you're saying about climate change as well. Right. But the more specific we can be, more then we can, specific. yeah, okay. get more uh, presenters. And I have some other topic suggestions, but I um I'll past the, uh, you know, I can raise them later after others may have more to raise on agriculture right now. Um, anyone else on agriculture before we open up to other items? Okay. Um, other topics from anyone that they'd really like to explore at, at our retreat? Karina, it's a it's an opportunity for us to have a longer meeting um, and invite. I mean, historically, we invited experts, agency folks, whoever we might find to help us have a more in-depth conversation about various topics. And it's a chance for all of us to spend a little bit longer, have the side conversations and dig a little deeper and and um, uh, just try to be more effective with our work. And so um, that's really what we're we're focusing on is just broad topics that. Have we not done enough on them? Have they lingered? Should we bring it back up? Has anybody learned anything new that they'd like to have a broader discussion around that doesn't fall into one of our regularly scheduled meetings or whether, you know, also it could be that let's let's not talk about this item at the uh, at the retreat, but let's be sure we build it into 
some of our planning for the September to June meetings, because that's part of what we do at the retreat is also begin to build out um, the a, a rough agenda and topics for uh, our later meetings. Is it all day? Uh, I think we've done like 930 over lunch until three ish has been, I think, typical. It's a good chunk of the day. We try to do it someplace nice and mm -hmm. near the lake. It's been at Basin Harbor. It's been at the Sailing Center. It's been at. Shelburne Farms. Shelburne Farms. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting up all of you. Islands, up in the islands, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. OK, uh, anything else? Otherwise, uh, we can do a lot of this follow up electronically. Katie and I will send follow up on dates um, and then um, uh, doodle poll or something. And then, you know, at any time, it's worth throwing out ideas for retreat planning or meeting. But go ahead, Lori. So additionally, I think we want to keep following up on aquatic invasive species, not only um, the canal barriers, although, you know, our our focus is the legislature, but it's some sometimes, you know, we might be pushing a legislative resolution to pass on to other entities. So I think we want to look at that, not only specifically around Gobi, stay on top of that, but the larger issue of funding that we heard about and just weren't able to have any influence on right now with uh, the in Vermont that the the uh, the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation is woefully understaffed in terms of aquatic invasive species management at the same time when use is up at our recreational areas right. uh, and the threats are there too and have increased well i'm i'm hoping that our conversation with commissioner herrick and eric um we can garner a path and some additional support to press harder to um the governor to find funds to to um ramp up that especially in light of this all this additional energy and publicity around around gobi Hopefully, people will be paying more attention to it too, um, and we we can find a little more leverage to be uh, more effective than we were in our in our request. So, I agree. We'll we'll um, you know I think broad AIS will certainly be another topic for planning, and then into the fall, I'm sure also. Uh, anything else for now? I see that Eric's joined. I don't see whether uh, Chris has joined. We're having some teams troubles, uh, so we're trying to get him into the meeting now. OK. Karina, are you still there? I am. I'm I'm about to sign off, though. That's that's what I thought. It just okay. while you're there. Um, can you I see your post about Josh Faulkner um, and from Hillary and follow up? Can you let what what was his conversation? What was the the gist of his presentation at the Nuipka conference? Um, a similar topic. He was presenting on his um, watershed model that he's been working on. He has mm -hmm. some data on that. His control, both his control site, um, it's a sub watershed, and then his um, manipulation site. And it was a really good presentation. Okay. 
I can give you the t I can give you more details too. OK, thanks. Yeah, if you guys haven't seen him, he's done some great work with um, both tile drain and also um, climate change. He's really focused on climate change and ag and how th that interface those interface. Terrific. Yeah, so his title was um, embarking on a long term partnership for invasive watershed monitoring and research. Great, thanks. Oh, hi, Commissioner Herrick, how are you? Good, I'm sorry, I for some reason, it won't join through my computer, so I had to join through my phone. Okay, well, we're glad you're here. Okay, so um, we can move to, uh, Eric is still on too. Um, we can move to our agenda item and it's an opportunity to introduce ourselves and be introduced to Commissioner Chris Herrick, uh, the relatively new Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife. Eric Palmer, I think, Eric, you've been in front of us before, or certainly many of us. I think we've had a chance to uh, hear presentations from you. So um, uh, I guess, Chris, if you want to start and uh, make an introduction and, and uh, we'll go from there. I'll let you run it from here. Thanks, Mark. So, um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Herrick, and as Mark said, I'm the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife. I have been in this position since the first week in November. Um, just to give you a little history, um, I live in Grand Isle. Um, I've been in Grand Isle County since 1989. And um, prior to this job, I was the deputy Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. And prior to that, I was the Director of Vermont Emergency Management. And prior to that, for 17 years, I ran the state uh, hazmat response team. In addition to that, um, I was the uh, select board chair in South Hero and the fire chief. And at uh, one point, we I was on uh, during the ice storm, I believe we had a fire at the uh, Lake Champlain uh, Basin building. And I was uh, first through the door with the fire department at that uh, fire back in, I think it was in 98. I can't remember, that's a long time ago. Um, but um, I am also a um, avid outdoorsman. Um, I spend a fair amount of time fishing when I can between work and um, so anyway, that's um, that's who I am in a nutshell. I've brought with me today um, Eric Palmer, who you do know, and we certainly can answer or try to answer any questions you might have. I've asked um, Eric, and I don't know if Mike has made it yet. Um, I see there's some guests in the lobby, but I don't know who all is here yet. Oh, I see Mike. No, that's not Mike. Um, so anyway, Mike, that's Mike had a, a, his son's baseball game to go to, and he was going to join us as quickly as he could after that. So he okay. he hopes to be on uh, shortly after six. Okay, great. Um, so that's that's who I am, um, and I think you know I've asked Mark. To, uh, I'm sorry, Eric, to come because uh, he has a great deal more expertise than I do. Uh, but as Mark knows, uh, I've been committed to um, the environment and also in the lake in my work with the hazmat team. And I think maybe the last time we were in a meeting like this together, we were discussing uh, crude oil on the rail line moving down on the uh, western shore. Exactly. Uh, yep. And I think that was in Shelburne, if I recall correctly. Right, so I, I uh, <clears throat> I've known Chris a long time as as a neighbor up in South Hero, and and also in his role in emergency management and hazmat response. And so, I think the last time that uh, Chris, you had a very different hat on uh, when we had probably the best attended Vermont Citizens Advisory Committee meeting ever. 
um, was related to uh, getting some traction on on an integrated response to uh, to the inevitable oil spill from the the oil cars down the the west shore of the lake. So, um, for committee members, we've asked Chris to join us to introduce himself, um, have a chance to meet. We'd we'd often heard from. Lewis or and or from Mike Wachowski um, related to access issues um, and improvements that were happening. Um, so we thought we'd get a chance to have Chris connect with us, have a conversation and, you know, again, two key issues that we thought we could uh, discuss were invasive species, aquatic invasive species, and particularly in relation to the round goby and the potential impact uh, on the recreational fishery, which is so important for uh, particularly the Vermont side and um, Vermont fish and wildlife and Vermont anglers um, uh, and other invasives. And um, and as we noted earlier, um, the DEC has woefully underfunded the invasive species program, aquatic invasive species program, um, and we had requested some additional funding and it, I don't think we were heard very well. Um, and so we're hoping, Chris, we can talk a little bit more about how we might uh, <laughs> join forces to uh, try to build up the invasive sure. program in the state. Um, and also any updates on uh, perhaps any additional funding that might be coming into the uh, Fish and Wildlife Department for access improvements, access acquisition, and particularly our focus has been Southern Lake Champlain access and up and into the tributaries. Um, we were aware there were some interesting things happening on Otter Creek, and so I don't know if you or Mike or uh, Eric might be able to update us on, on um, Sure. any of the work happening there so i think what i what i'll do is i'll start um at a higher level and uh but when we start getting into the nitty-gritty i'll defer to eric with, with regard to the um, um invasive species and mike when it talk we talk about access um improvement and acquisition and those are certainly uh, on our radar with regard to um and i'll specifically refer to the brown goby um, I have been working directly with um, New York DEC and encouraging them um, to see the protection of Lake Champlain at the same, with the same level of urgency as we do here in Vermont. And had, I would describe, moderate to good success in that area. And, um, as you're probably aware, they're, they're working with, uh, uh, they don't own the canal, uh, the locks. And so they're working with a private, um, it was a New York canal. I can't remember the term exactly. You probably remember it, but it has, it's knife, knifers, I think owns it, not knifers. That's the New, New York uh, electric company. And, what they they have one plan right now while we wait for the uh, army corps to come up with a long-term solution of double flushing the canal last week as it turns out um they did one um survey of the canal system and this is where i'll rely on eric and determine where they did that and they're going to do a series more sampling, they did not find the round goby. And so while that's encouraging, um, it's not the final answer by any means. And so we certainly are concerned about that um, moving up the system and through the locks into the, uh, the southern part of the lake. Eric, did you want to comment on that a little bit? Um, it I think you guys might have had a, a round goby discussion um, before we joined, and um, obviously Meg Modley is is very much in the the loop on this stuff. But yeah, what what Chris says is is correct. The canal has been a vector for 
for quite a number of invasive species getting into Lake Champlain. Round goby is, is the current threat, but certainly not the only threat. Um, they are in the Hudson River, so we're looking at that as, as sort of a more imminent threat, but there's other things like Asian carp that we worry about as well, and, and who knows what might be coming up the Hudson next. Um, and the, the New York Canal Corporation has an interest in keeping that canal open for kind of tourist traffic as well as commercial traffic. We would you know, prefer to see the canal closed until they have a more permanent solution to preventing the movement of Ron Gobi and other invasive fish species. Um, and if, if there's anything more I can add, if you guys haven't already had a, an in-depth discussion of that, I'll happy to, to answer questions for what I know. And uh, Sean Good is also our department rep on the rapid response team um, that, that Meg chairs. Hi, yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, Meg and, and Eric Howe gave us an update uh, um, on most of that and also shared uh, Sean's recent um, uh, outreach that he wrote for the LCI Derby Gazette. Um, and so that was shared with us on the post too. Um, but I, I appreciate it. it's the first I've heard uh, anyone from the department um, aligned with our resolution asking the governor and the New York Canal Corp to close the canals now until they figure out a better way in the long term. So um, I appreciate your um, sharing that with us. It, it, it wasn't clear and I, I hope the governor also spoke with the same um, uh, conviction uh, to the extent he communicated at all with. Yeah, to, to be clear, that, that's been our position. We've, we've said that multiple times in internal meetings. That's not necessarily the governor's position on uh -huh. this issue. Um, he's still having high level discussions with New York. And like I said, they, they have multiple entities. It's not just New York DEC. The New York Canal Corporation has their own interests in, in keeping the canal open. Um, right. So we see this as a, a significant threat, not just Ron Gobies, but the canal is a vector. Um, but right now, the, we're continuing to look at, at studies and monitoring to see if Ron Gobies are moving into the canal. Um, but yeah, we, we would like to see this addressed. We feel that this is a very important issue and a, a big vector coming into Lake Champlain, not the only vector, obviously, for round gobies. I assume you guys talked about the potential for movement through bait buckets or even deliberate introduction from misguided anglers who might think that it would be a benefit to smallmouth bass fishing. And that's part of why we're doing the outreach, part of why Sean has you know, written articles like, like the one he did for the, the LCI Gazette. That's exactly some of our earlier discussions. Um, the executive committee, and I'll get to you in just a second, Laura, I just have a quick question. The executive committee, I'm sorry, the Lake Champlain Basin Program Steering Committee heard uh, um, an update from the Quebec partners, and uh, they noted that they had banned uh, live bait in Quebec. And I, I'm not an angler. I love clients uh, who who uh, love the water and are are um, are out there and uh, passionate about it. But um, can you share with us what are the criteria and what are the issues around live bait and a potential ban of utilization of live bait? What are the what are the issues related to that? I I don't know that I understand that very well. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to take that. Um, and again, I'm just by way of introduction, I'm Eric Palmer. I've been the, the Fish Division Director for Fish and Wildlife since 2000. So I, I met most of you in, in various forums and formats um, over the, the past two decades. And I've been with the department for about 30 years, started as a, a fish biologist. Um, and we've, we've been talking about live bait um, when I came, there, there were very few 
rules and restrictions on the use of live bait. It was mostly about how bait was collected, what size saying or minnow trap you could use. Um, and then we discovered uh, alewife in Lake St. Catherine and passed some, some fairly significant changes to the bait fish regulations um, that restricted what species could be used as bait in Vermont. Um, <clears throat> that then was followed by the, the movement of VHS, viral hemorrhagic septicemia, into the Great Lakes and the potential for moving bait fish to inadvertently move that disease with it. And then we, we came up with even more restrictions on um, who could collect bait and how it could be moved. Um, we have not gone as, as far as um, banning the movement of bait in Vermont and and certainly when you look at Champlain, you know, New York has not banned the movement of, of bait on their side of the lake either. Um, but we have come up with a, a variety of restrictions um, looking at at species, looking at the, the issue of invasive species, not just the, the bait itself, but also the potential to inadvertently move diseases or, you know, other aquatic hitchhikers um, when moving bait. And I'm, I'm happy to get into more specifics if folks want. It's a pretty complicated subject, so I don't want to <laughs> talk too long without knowing more specifically what you'd like to, to hear about. And I, I also noticed uh, Mike Wachowski has, has joined the meeting. Thanks, Eric. I think, uh, I mean, for me, I just was wondering, um, obviously there's sort of social cultural impacts of a bait ban and anglers who have used bait and have their practices that they're comfortable with or preferred and uh, anytime you take away something that feels like it's a right or whatever it's an issue um so i i just i'm not aware of how important that is um to our anglers and then i guess more importantly is the consistency between New York and Vermont regarding any regulations so that um, the basin is sort of managed holistically. And so I guess without going too deep, if you could at least talk about what you what you know working with your peers in New York, um, how different are they and how important do you think it is that you know, maybe I'm wrong, but how important it is that we do have a consistent sort of holistic approach to that? Um, yeah, the New York, we we feel that New York has a, a greater risk on certainly on the disease front of bait fish movement. Uh, VHS is present in Lake Ontario, uh, which is a, a source of bait collection. They do allow wild bait to be collected commercially tested and moved, whereas we say that commercial bait needs to be held on site, not collected from the wild and tested for multiple years with negative tests before it can be imported into the state. Um, so there, our regulations are, are more restrictive in a number of ways than New York's. Um, the, obviously anglers from both sides of the, the lake fish Lake Champlain. Um, we originally were trying to direct anglers more towards the, the commercially purchased bait as opposed to wild bait collection. We have had some issues with commercial bait, including the presence of central mud minnows, uh, sticklebacks, and most recently mosquito fish showing up in, in commercial bait deliveries. We detected those, um, pulled the, the importation permits from those facilities and have continued to, to check the, the incoming bait arriving. In, in this case, you know, a, a lot of it is coming from down south Arkansas where, where it's much easier to grow bait. Um, but because of some of those threats and, you know, anglers, you know, I think rightfully saying that they, they feel the bait they collect in the wild in Vermont is is likely to be safer than imported bait. We have loosened some of the restrictions on on individual anglers collecting and using bait um, within the state of Vermont and being able to move it 
um, <clears throat> within the state as long as it's not being collected from uh, a high risk water body such as Lake Champlain, Connecticut River, um, Lake Carmi, Lake St. Catherine, lakes where we, we know that we already have invasive species present or where we see a, just a high risk of a you know, potential vector like the, the Connecticut River um, being open, not just to New Hampshire, but open to the Atlantic Ocean. That, that's great, thanks. Uh, that's a lot of clarity for me. So, um, Lori, you had your hand up? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Chris and Eric, uh, Sean and Mike for continuing to push on this issue. I know, Commissioner, you've been in regular contact with New York DEC and keeping this on the radar screen and you're all working in your various arenas to keep advancing that. I'm wondering, I, I know, Eric, you noted that um, the department's position is different than the governor's position, so per se, on closing the canal. Uh, the CAC has recommended closing the canal, as have advocacy organizations, you know, my own included. And I'm wondering, what is the Agency of Natural Resources stance on this now? Have they supported that? And, you know, uh, because we did not get clarity on that when we spoke to um, Julie Moore. I can take that. Um, so while the department prefers that they close the canal, as do a number of folks, uh, there's also a recognition that as much pressure as we put on DEC in New York, their hands are tied somewhat because they don't control it directly. And so uh, they're in a, a position where they are trying to extract the best possible option they can get reasonably. Because uh, at some point, the canal could just turn around and say, We're, it's fine, There's no, we have a negative test, we're not doing anything. And so the agency and um, to a large part, the department, although let me be clear, our preference is to close it. The agency understands the uh, position that New York DEC is in, and we wanna work with them uh, to get the best possible results we can. Okay, thank you. I know that may not be the answer you wanna hear, <laughs> uh, but it is the answer. Thanks, Chris. Um, Thanks for asking. Uh, now. <laughs> um, any more questions? I see uh, Jeff Wenberg had a, a question in the comment. Jeff's uh, uh, mic and camera don't seem to be working, but he his statement or question was: Assuming the focus on reducing nutrients makes reasonable progress. Would it be correct to say that the single largest threat to the future quote unquote health of Lake Champlain is invasive species? And by health, he means the ability of the lake to continue and improve its current and traditional ecosystems. So that's probably a question for you, Eric. Um, yeah, I, I think invasive species would be right up there. In fact, I, I might put it higher than than nutrients. Um, nutrients, I, I feel, you know, as, as big an issue as that is, there are some, some solutions that, if they're effectively implemented, could improve that situation. Once an invasive species is in the lake, trying to get it out of the lake again is, is nearly impossible. So I, I think that, uh, yeah, invasive species are a huge threat to the health of Lake Champlain. Um, <clears throat> The, you know, the lake continues to, to change as each new invasive species shows up. Um, and I, I hate to think, again, what, what else could be coming down the pike um, for the lake. So addressing that threat as much as we can, addressing the vectors, doing good public outreach, I think is, is really important. Thanks. Um, any other, uh, go ahead, Meg. Thanks, Mark. Um, I just wanted to, uh, hi, Commissioner Herrick and Eric, good to see you. And I'm glad, Mike, you're on. Um, 
We have had some really great success with our boat launch steward program in addressing the, you know, the overland transport on boats and trailers as a possible pathway of introduction. We've had a number of good saves. Um, and over the past 15 years, we've really been able to document which uh, Vermont access sites see the greatest threat of movement of invasive species. Um, and last year, we were able to successfully cite um, a decontamination station at Mallets Bay boat launch, which um, is a tricky launch because it's very busy um, and with the upper and lower lot and um, the need to access, you know, the water in a reasonable amount of time um, was a challenging pilot year to sort of have the decon station there. And um, I'm I'm extending a, an invitation um, to see if we can talk a little bit more about placing the decon unit um, in a more prominent location in the upper lot um, so that we can effectively get boats um, inspected and decontaminated as as necessary. Um, it's less of an issue at the John Gilmet launch in South Hero and at Shelburne, um, but I think that is our highest risk launch and, and I hope that we can find a good place for that decon site um, for the 22 field season. Um, I, I'm going to defer that to Mar, um, I'm sorry, to Mike, and I'm also going to ask Mike to talk a little bit about uh, the ambassador program that we talked about earlier. So, yeah, um, did we lose him? Yeah, it seems like Mike dropped out for a second. We'll see if we can get him back. The um, the access uh, ambassador program. Um, I actually signed off on that today. I think yeah, today's Monday. Um, having folks at uh, access areas to inspect boats and uh, I guess it's called a greeter program. I'm using the wrong term of art. Um, and so Mike and I talked a lot about that. Um, and as far as the decon unit, um, I'm not, I, I, I've, I've not go to, I don't go to the Mallet Space site very often, but it's certainly something we'll consider. Um, I know the upper lot is going, uh, to need some repair work done on it uh, because of some damage that was done this winter. So, but uh, hopefully we can get Mike back because he's certainly the expert on this area. And uh, he should be with us so, now. Yes, I, I I don't know what happened. I might have touched something. I apologize for that. And suddenly, <laughs> as soon as I had to talk, uh, uh, my call cut out. Um, but I started to say, yeah, Meg, uh, we can definitely talk about that. Um, uh, locating it in a, a better location uh, in the upper lot. And uh, Commissioner Herrick was referring to some damage uh, after the pond hockey tournament or during it um, of all all weekends. We had a, like a, almost a 60 degree weekend um, on Saturday of that three day event. And as you might imagine, um, things started to thaw. And so we've been trying to repair the upper lot to make it uh, usable and hopefully that'll be open soon. Um, so it shouldn't be an issue come, you know, in a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, we can certainly talk offline about, about uh, where where we can put that decon unit, where why it didn't work as well, uh, given where it was located, and, and and figure out how to make that a more prominent um, and accessible uh, decon station. Thanks, Mike. That's great. Mike, I also, while you were on your hiatus, uh, talked a little bit about the greeter program. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to highlight that or maybe people are already familiar with it. Yeah, um, so yeah, generally DEC runs the, the greeter program um, within the Inland Lakes um, and these are typically um, summer, you know, college students getting summer jobs and educating the public on um, the uh, invasive exotic uh, um, threats to um, various water bodies and and they'll inspect boats some some stations or uh, access areas actually have uh, decon units where people can get their boats washed down um, and 
on Lake Champlain and the basin that are referred to as stewards through the Lake Champlain Basin, Lake Champlain basin program. So, you know, Meg and I have been working together on that um, for a number of years and, and really I'm just meeting up with her, her stewards once, once a year. And when she goes through the training and talking to them about our access program and um, I do the same thing for DEC uh, and, and the employees that work with the lake associations or the municipalities where these uh, access areas are located. Um, but those programs by and large run really well. Um, and I think because of all the efforts of these greeters and stewards, um, uh, the word is definitely out there about uh, aquatic nuisance species threats and what can be done to prevent them. Um, but there's always some people that that maybe don't they're not as diligent in cleaning their boats and checking for um, quote weeds on the back of their trailers or motors. Um, so continuing to have those folks at our access areas, I, I think uh, provides a, a nice benefit um, to protecting the lakes. Thanks, Mike. Um, I see Wayne has his hand. Yeah, just curious. I know there's been a lot of discussion on the Colchester. I know how busy the uh, the launches on the weekends. What about resources for some of the other boat launches like Burlington, Shelburne? You know, as we go south and some of the northern parts of the lake, is there similar coverage expected at those other boat launches? Yeah, Wayne, we've been able to expand the program. So the okay. basin program um, is now, we will have somebody stationed at Converse Bay. Much of the boat launch access sites south of there, Mike can explain, are much smaller or in um, need of some, you know, fixing. Um, they haven't warranted having a person there um, for, you know, 10 or less trailer parking spots. We can visit them occasionally. But Converse Bay, Shelburne Bay, and then last year we made inroads into the Burlington Waterfront through Parks and Rec. So we're at Perkins Pier and the U.S. Coast Guard or the Burlington Waterfront Station. Then we go up to Colchester Point on Windermere Way. We're at Mallet's Bay Boat Launch, the South Hero Boat Launch. And then um, as frequently as we can, we're at the St. Albans and Swanton launches as well. Yeah, totally appreciate the challenges. I've always told people that if you want some entertainment on a weekend is grab a couple lawn chairs and a six pack of beer and sit at the Colchester Mallet's Bay boat launch from like four to six in the afternoon. It's pretty interesting experience. <laughs> Good advice. We also do um, provide a grant to Quebec so that they have stewards trained in delivering the same messages and collecting the same data on Missisquoi Bay. Um, we used to run the program on the New York side of the lake, but now Paul Smith College at the Adirondack Watershed Institute picks up the majority of the New York DEC launches. However, we will still cover Plattsburgh North to point a rush and the Shazy landing on Lake Champlain because those sites have not been able to secure stewards for this field season. Okay, thanks, Mike. Meg, can you clarify, are mandatory, is that only in Lake George Basin or is that... Um, Lake yes, George so and then the Adirondack Northway inspection station is mandatory, isn't it? No. Um, uh, well, you're supposed to pull over and get inspected. Um, it's not a mandatory program with um, meaning they're going to come after you lights and sirens if you don't pull yeah. over and get your boat inspected there. Um, that station is really critical in the expansion or at least the future of what I hope the boat launch steward program, which is referred to nationally as watercraft inspection and decontamination programs will look like in Vermont in the future will include roadside decontamination stations on Interstate 89 and 91. Um, but to answer your other question, um, Lake George Park Commission, a branch of the New York State Agency, has full control over all points of access to Lake George, and therefore they do have a mandatory inspection and decontamination program before launch um, into that lake. Um, there are rules and regulations that say that you are not, it's illegal to transport things and launch with them on your boat. Um, but we don't have mandatory inspection before launch. And as you know, the Adirondacks in Vermont are littered with many, many lakes, and we cannot staff them all. So we're hoping to deliver the same national messages of clean, drain, dry, and stop aquatic hitchhikers, be stationed at the busiest launches where we know, based on our 15 years of data, where the greatest number of aquatic hitchhikers move to and from. Um, and then you know, hope that the rules and regulations and the wardens and the environmental conservation officers um, can support us if we um, basically encounter any challenges. 
Great. Thanks, Meg. Any other questions right now, Wayne? Or is that old? <laughs> no, just a quick question. Um, with any um, public education outreach done at the marinas, Meg, I mean, that's a huge change over the last couple of years, too. And seeing some of the Canadians return here this year, um, you know, it's been, hasn't been like that for a couple of years now, but just curious what um, opportunities, I guess, what's being done at some of the private marinas. I think there's always room for growth. Um, I mean, we have a good partnership with Lake Champlain Sea Grant and the Lake Champlain Basin Program, um, where we hand out our rack cards, the clean, drain, dry rack cards that have examples of invasive species and the steps that you can take to prevent spread. But, um, you know, working with Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department as well on making sure that we refresh those stations, um, that we provide education and outreach at those locations would also be good. Um, it's been challenging because marinas are pretty strapped and busy. Um, but they're willing and open to receive information and distribute it. So I have a question. Have we ever worked with AOT? Um, a lot of these boat registrations are handled probably online, but some may be handled by mail. Um, do we ever think about asking them to insert something about uh, invasive aquatics? Mike, do you know the answer to that question? I know the answer in New York is that you can't get your registration or renewal without clicking through a clean, drain, dry page in New York State. I don't know if we have that um, invasive species education message as part of the registration or renewal for anything in the state of Vermont, but I do know that Vermont Fish and Wildlife requires the special use permits um, for fishing tournaments to contact the state or the basin program to get the rack cards. I'd say less than 10% of fishing tournaments actually do that. Um, but I do have requests. I have one in right now um, to send um, some out to an organizer of a fishing tournament on Lake Champlain. That's a, that's a really interesting uh, idea to, to create that linkage there. Um, Chris, in the last at least the last two years, I think that the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee has made a recommendation to consider mandatory boat inspections. And I think the thought is to, you know, mimic the one that's on 87 in the in the Adirondack Northway. Um, in my mind, I always thought about it at the way station and inspection station down there at, in, what is it, Muddy Creek. Um, at Colchester um, Milton area or yeah. Colchester and I, I wonder whether those two items maybe we have a conversation with our neighbor who who runs that department and and uh or runs that agency and see if we can find some alignment for some support there that was my thought take take them fishing and take them down right. to inspect the the uh, John Gilmet very successful decontamination program at John Gilmet and um Mike's done a great job with. with, with That's a captive up. audience, you know. He and I own a camp together up in Canaan on Lake Wallace. I, I was thinking that. <laughs> I will have that discussion and see if I can make any progress. I think there's also an idea that there's a possibility that some of the infrastructure dollars that come into the state could be used for supporting development of the actual site. Um, and the equipment, not for time for people to run it, but um, there is a possibility of securing some infrastructure dollars to work on uh, some of some of the big costs. And, and um, thanks, Meg. And that's a segue. If there is another question, a uh, nice segue for Mike and Chris. Um, I'm not aware of any specifics and maybe you can share with us of any additional funding that the the uh, department might be getting and whether those infrastructure funds or residual ARPA funds or any other funding might be going for um, a more than ordinary course of business improvements, um, development or acquisitions of access areas. So uh, I'll let Mike get into the detail, but the only extra funds that I'm aware of um, are potentially for EV charging stations. <laughs> I, I heard that. 
So, and yeah. that's uh, also limited to, we can't put them at every, every site uh, for other reasons with federal funding restrictions. But Mike, did you want to delve into this? Uh, I think um, it's, it's a bigger, broader question too on what we're moving forward with this year. Yeah, we, we, um, we, we don't have any funding available specifically for, you know, improving, you know, um, acquiring decon stations or that sort of thing. Um, the money that we've gotten, we've, we've targeted to kind of some high dollar projects that we need to, um, retrofit, um, the, the Windermere Way site or Colchester Point, uh, in Colchester on the Winooski River. That's, that's going to be a four or $500,000 project. Um, there was some sheet piling put in there 30 years ago and it, it really, we realize it ends up kind of restricting the river there a little bit and creates some serious problems on the boat ramp with siltation. So we're actually looking at removing some of, some of that and resetting it to try and widen the river and allow it a little bit more flow. So we've we've been utilizing um, funding that we've gotten from the legislature recently for those sorts of kind of big ticket items. And uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any kind of quote extra money other than what Commissioner Herrick said about uh, potentially using money um, to acquire EV charging stations and, and place them at some of our access areas, which I'm not exactly sure if that's can, gone through yet or if that's still um, in discussion at the legislative level. It's in the big bill, but um, it's also $5 million across forest and parks and fish and wildlife. So we'll see what happens with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I um I had heard about that, but it it didn't seem as terribly important or relevant right at this time. I heard it all had to be US made product and I understand that's really hard to get your hands on that too. So um any other questions for Mike or Eric or Chris while we have them? I see a hand. May I go ahead? Sorry, it's Meg again from the Lake Champlain Basin Program. I have a question to point put out there. I know we've had um, some challenges. We've purchased a number of high pressure hot water decontamination stations, which are currently um, we gave over to Vermont DEC um, that are living in the annex, um, but the annex space in Montpelier or Berlin technically is limited. Um, I'm wondering if um, we, we might also explore an opportunity where if we are able to find resources to purchase additional decon stations, if um, Fish and Wildlife might be able to, to own them um, and, and house them at some of their various locations. That could be grateful, useful in advancing the program. So I'm sure we can find space. How much are they, by the way? Um, the largest ones we buy are 400 gallon tanks that are on their own um, trailers. They go at $25,000. They have a recirculating pad. Oh yeah, but they run, um, they don't need a, an electrical or water hookup because they're self contained. You can buy much cheaper ones if you can um, use them at sites where you have water or power available. So maybe before I say we can store them, how big are they? What's their footprint? Mm, uh, probably should look at that in more detail, probably like a 10 foot by a 12 foot or 15 foot footprint Trailer. for the big ones. Wow. It's okay. on, it's loaded on a trailer. It, it comes on a trailer. That's how it you move it around. Right. Got it. OK. That's that's the that's the biggest one that we would get. Those are the biggest ones we have. I, I I'm sure. I mean, if we're not talking about a dozen of them, uh, I'm sure we can find we have partners in the state uh, that we can work with. Um, that we should be able to find locations for them. And they need to be stored inside during the winter, I presume. Um, some of them can be winterized um, and left okay. outside as long as they're protected. 
Okay. Somehow. That's, that's helpful too. Others benefit from being winterized. Yeah. Perfect. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, Mark, I, I know that before Mike got on, you mentioned uh, Otter Creek and an interest in some of the access work we're doing there. I didn't know if you wanted to follow up with Mike now that he's here. Yeah, thank you. Mike, I think we heard that there was some initial work. I think you might have shared with it with us last year. Um, uh, looking at Otter Creek and, you know, sort of connecting some existing public and or private access areas and sort of integrating them. And I, I, I think it was from you and I know that um, Senator Bray was very interested in it. And I just don't know if any other progress had been made amidst COVID constraints and things like that. So. Um, Am I? Yes. Yeah, I, I can I can expand on that a little bit. So um, I, I I believe I may have sent something in, in writing to uh, this committee last year. I, I don't believe I was actually at a meeting, um, but we we are looking at um, trying to create uh, what I'm calling an Otter Creek fishing trail. Um, it's the long longest river, wholly within uh, completely within Vermont. And so we've identified, I think, nine fish and wildlife properties. Some of them currently exist um, where you can't access the creek. Uh, others, we have land along the creek, but there's no real good access. So we've been looking at uh, creating more paddling access, not so much motorboat access, because even if these sites uh, we built, boat ramps at them so you could launch uh, a motor boat. Oftentimes you can't really get very far because of the massive log jams and, and obstacles within the creek itself. So um, our plan is hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have about five improved sites in addition to some of the existing sites. And then from there, I've been slowly talking with like the town of Rutland, um, uh, Middlebury and possibly Wallingford. There's one other town in there. I can't um, remember which one it is right now, but there are some other access sites or there are some uh, municipalities that are slowly thinking about improving recreational access within their um, town limits. And so we're trying to get some other municipalities on board and then um, we might actually try and target one or two private landowners that have basically allowed informal access for many years and try and get them under a lease or maybe we can acquire land. Um, there is an active acquisition going on right now um, on the Otter Creek. Our wildlife division is working on that and that'll actually be another access site once that is acquired. And so that'll actually plug one of the, the large holes in this trail that we're trying to create. Um, the, the intention is to try and create a point to point paddling trail so you can go all the way from Mount Tabor to Lake Champlain um, and you can do a half day paddle, full day paddle um, and fish, bird watch, you know, just get out and boat on the Otter Creek. So that's that's kind of the intention there. That's great. Um, I know that Senator Bray was very interested and in, had asked some specific questions um connected to it we'll follow up um and he may may be helpful in in his region there so um that's exciting you know it, mike as you know we've advocated for southern lake and more paddling type access so we much appreciate it we've heard for a decade that um vermonters would like more of that in that region so i think that's really helpful um, okay, we have just a few minutes left. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any last questions? Real quick that we do. Oh, still there. I'm here. Okay, sorry, I thought someone was. Mike, you can try that. again. It was Mike Wachowski. Yeah. <laughs> 
Th thanks, Meg. I, I was just going to throw out there, Mark, that um, we're actually uh, close to closing on a property that will expand the Larrabee's Point access as well. So that will create um, some sorely needed parking on the southern part of the lake. And we did have a contract last year to improve the Fort Cass and boat ramp, which is on the Otter Creek, right? At, I don't know. 200 yards from the mouth of the creek um, and, and that one was was slowed because um, strangely enough the boat ramp sits on top of a 5,000 year old Native American site um, and, <laughs> and it's completely intact somehow we built the boat ramp on the site and as far as we can tell nothing was impacted so our plan was to basically tear out part of the existing ramp build a new ramp that had a little bit longer um, approach and steeper and would allow boats to get in and out uh, much easier during low water and um, we've had to do a lot of additional work to ensure that we're not going to negatively impact um, native american resources um, and so we're we've not quite gotten over that yet but we're continuing to work on that so um, if things come together this fall we'll have hopefully a plan in place to move forward and maybe next fall we'll be able to do um, some improvements at that site. So those are some other kind of South Lake uh, projects that we are working on. Excellent. Thanks for that update. Be interesting to have a interpretive um, installation right next to the ramp too regarding the site, whoever's going to be doing that additional work at the uni from the university or wherever. So um yep. Okay, um, I think we're coming to a close. Um, Eric, Mike, Chris, particularly, thanks. It was really great to have a chance to have you with us and have a conversation. We very much appreciate your enthusiasm and support for increasing access and um, and particularly for the urgency around invasive species. I appreciate um, Jeff's point that invasive species is probably likely the largest issue facing the Lake Champlain ecosystem right now or should be our, our greatest urgency. So that gives us uh, more fuel for our fire as we continue to move in that direction. Um, and um, I guess if there's nothing else, uh, Kitty and I will follow up with um, uh, meeting planning for June and for July and uh, we'll look forward to any more of your suggestions for both date and topic and um, otherwise enjoy this beautiful week of sunshine and summer in Vermont and we'll see you all